Hello and welcome. So it's been an interesting week this week because we've had Microsoft build. Now it's an unusual one for data people because it's usually this big developer conference. Isn't really that much for us most of the time. But there's been a load of announcements this time. Loads of things around cognitive services, lots of AI, lots of things to do with um, fairness and bias and responsible AI. But the big thing on our side is this whole thing called Azure Synapse. So around November last year, you might have heard of Azure Synapse Analytics being rolled out, and it was kind of just a rebranding of Azure SQL Data Warehouse. But there's a whole lot more than that. It's, it's actually a giant workspace with a little bit of SQL Data Warehouse, a bit of Spark, a bit of SQL On Demand, a bit of Data Factory, and various things plumbed in, with the idea is it's just a one single stop platform. That's the plan. So now, for the first time, it's in public preview. So all of those other bits, the Spark bit, the SQL On Demand bit, this ADF bit, you can now play with those pieces. So the SQL Data Warehouse in GA, been in GA for ages, years. The new bit is all of the Spark and SQL and other bits. So I thought I'd have a bit of a play. So it's only this morning that I actually first time in my own subscription tried to spin up a um, workspace and have a go. So I thought you can join me on the journey of can I get it working? Can I hook it up to my existing warehouse? Can I do some of the stuff that I currently do in Databricks? Can I do that in uh, Synapse Analytics? So let's have a look. Okay, so I've got my portal set up. I think I have already made a workspace this morning. There's nothing in it currently. So I'm just gonna show you quickly how we create one. Let's have a quick go. So I assume I can just find it under Synapse. Okay, so we've got two options there. We've got the Workspaces Preview and we've got the formerly SQL Data Warehouse. So you can create the normal just warehouse on its own, or you can say, I want this new thing that's in Public Preview, not fully available yet, it's not fully supported yet, and we can go from there and see what it looks like. Okay, so creating the Synapse Workspace, what do we need? So I've created a quick Synapse resource group, normal stuff. You need to give it a name. Now, interestingly, you can't do like that kind of thing. We don't only have lowercase, so it's a bit like blob storage in the naming convention. So let's go, I call it advancing synapse first, let's call it that. Can do it in UK SAS. So it's a nice rollout in that it's not going in just available in one or two little regions and then slowly spread out to the major ones and then eventually we get it in the kind of tertiary regions. Straight away, it seems available in all, which is great. So in my region, from subscription, so I need to give it a lake. So I need to point it at an ADLS Gen 2 subscription where it's going to create all its temporary stuff where it's going to use as save uh, data and that's kind of the root directory. Now I do already have a lick. Well, obviously I've got a lick. <laughs> and I've put uh, my root into it. So you can do those bits. A few more questions. So we can give it an admin user. So that's for the SQL Server part of it. So when it's actually doing the SQL pools, I can go and connect as an admin. I can use Manifest Studio and all that kind of normal stuff. Uh, I've got the Manifest Identity. So it's going to go and get certain permissions set up by default. So when we click create, it's going to go in and give itself permissions to that bit and that bit and that bit and that bit, which is interesting. Uh, we could choose to do it at network, so sure, network yourself up, why not? That obviously means that the bits that we've got are slightly more secure, but it means maybe plumbing it into other parts of our Azure subscription might be a little tricky, but you can see. Um, Okay, so let's do that. We're allowing other IP addresses. I'm not going to tag it because I'm doing a formal thing. If it's production, you should tag your resources. But let's just go and create that. Okay, so that's ready to create. I'm not going to hit go because, of course, it's something very similar to my previous one. And let's just go back and have a look at what gets created. So I've got this. I have Azure, Synapse, my workspace, advancing Synapse, sorry. A few things. So I've got different endpoints. So I'm connecting to a the actual data warehouse where I have to provision a service and leave it turned on with a number of compute pools and all that kind of stuff. I've got that endpoint. I want to write a query and there and then have it spin up some compute, run the query, give me my answer and turn things off again and then charge me for the data it passes through. I've got a different endpoint. So I've got two different SQL services depending on what I'm trying to do. Uh, and I've got a few different points like to my workspace and that kind of thing. So some interesting things. A few bits and pieces you can play around with, but honestly, most of it's not here. What we have is this button. So that launched Synapse Studio, and that's kind of the big flagship thing that they're doing. Everything is held inside this new studio. Same as Data Factory, same as Databricks, same as all the modern um, Azure tools, really. They come with their own browser. Now, this is one of the big arguments that Microsoft have been making about Synapse, is that it's an all-in-one studio. 
So you can go there and do a bit of Data Factory and build your ETL. You can do all your sparky things and actually make something scalable and quick and robust and working with some data science and some interesting types of data. And you can do your data warehouse bits, so you can have that SQL list then. Now, I've spoken previously about data lake houses. You know, can you have a single solution that's a little bit lake, a little bit warehouse, and kind of coming together in the middle? And this is the attempt. This is kind of their answer to that question to say, does this work? So what have we got? A few bits and pieces. So we have a workspace. We've got some data. Uh, we have no data yet, so we've got no databases. Um, we have a development area. We've got a pipelines area for doing orchestration and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in the Spark stuff, so I'm mainly going to be digging around there. So, okay, in SQL pools, it's provisioned as a SQL on demand cluster. So out of the box, by default, the one thing we definitely get is SQL on demand. And we're not really paying for that. That's just a, we'll pay for it if we use it and if we put some data through it. Um, for me, I want to do some Spark. So let's make a Spark pool. Okay, so I'm going to call this uh, Advancing Spark because we're not thinking about branding. Uh, don't want to auto scale for now. Okay, node size. So when we're talking Spark, that's obviously the size of the cluster. So each of my workers, my executors in that cluster, what size should they be? I'm going to go fairly small, 4 and 32. You can do a lot of things on that size of cluster. Leave it at three nodes. That's nice and easy. Not much else can do there. Additional settings. Uh, auto pause, yes, definitely. After 15 minutes, seems reasonable. Spark version, I get one option, 2.4. Hopefully, Spark 3.0 is coming, so, and that's in, currently in beta in Databricks. And that's gonna have a load of good stuff about uh, performance pass down and partition pruning and all that kind of stuff, so be good to see that here. Uh, so we've got Scala version, jo uh, Python version. So .NET is the interesting thing, because that's not in Databricks currently. So if you're trying to do a load of .NET integrations into signups, the fact that it's in straight away is pretty cool. And Delta Lake 0.4 is interesting because they announced 0.6 uh, during build. And they said that's now going to be rolled into it. So I'm assuming at some point very soon, you'll see your Spark um, pools suddenly updating and saying they do 1.6. Not huge amounts of difference between 1.4 and 1.6. few things in terms of how it handles stuff and some of the pass downs and things. And yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, so I'm going to review and create that. Yes, please go and do it for me. So that's gonna go and create a Spark cluster. So that's promising, good. Um, okay, so what can we do? I wanna actually develop something. So let's say, what can I do? I can do a new thing. So I'm gonna do a new, do a new Spark job definition, I guess, but a notebook's the way I normally work. So let's see what I can do. Okay, so we've got a notebook. So it's picked up that I have a Spark cluster. So that's great. So it's automatically picked it up. I'm assuming it's gonna to have to turn on somehow. But we'll see, and there we go. Okay, the Spark is done. And let's just say this is going to be our delta test, and we can see. So the lake I built signups on already had some delta tables. It's the lake I normally use for a lot of my experimentation and building frameworks and showing how some weird Sparky things work. So hopefully we can just use the same thing and it'll just work. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so I've got my languages. So I have Python, Scala, C Sharp, SQL. Note the one that's missing. There's no R in here. Um, okay, so let's add some code. Okay, we're ready to write, so we've got that ready to go. Um, okay, so I've got my data, I've got my stuff in here. So I, that's just, I like the fact that I can go and browse this stuff without leaving it. It's one of the biggest pains in data because it's having to shift between lots of different notebooks. Um, so linked. Okay, so I've got my link storage account. So that's the one that I know I've got data in. That's the one that I know I've got a load of delta tables. So I'd like to be able to go and read some stuff from there. Okay, cool. So I can see my tables. Uh, okay, so it's, it's created a signups um, folder in there. And that wasn't there before. Uh, right, so I know in my base layer, I've got some data I've categorized nicely. I've got my domain, so I've got a load of stuff, not adventure work type stuff. Uh, so let's go with address. Let me grab the root for that. So that's going to be, if I can just go and take the end of that, that'll be grand. Okay, so inside that, just give you a show that it's Delta, I've got that normal kind of stuff. So I've got a load of Parquet, a load of different files. It was created by a Spark job, and so there's no naming convention. It's just, I don't care what those files look like. I'm going to query the directory, 
and then just assume everything's going to be taken care of inside there. And I've got my Delta mug. It says various things. I've only just done an insert here. So there's nothing much going on. So this folder, this going up to address, actually going up to one, that is the address I want to push back and say, can you please do me a query on that? So let's see if we can get that working. Okay, so if I do dead frame, I want to do spark, let's see, dot read, formats. Okay, I'm getting a bit of IntelliSense, that's good. So the format's delta, and I'm gonna say I want to load from, and then give it that, so that's slash one. Okay, so I don't know if that's gonna work. So based on, if that's just the native place where things are running, then it should pick up if that's its root folder. Uh, I might need to do some config, might need to do something to get that to recognize that. Can I control enter? Yeah, okay. So that's trying to do the Spark session, is trying to load that in, it's trying to make that work. So, looks promising. Uh, I like the fact that it's already got that data in it, that's always nice. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I would have thought it would automatically have some kind of default hive store, uh, but it doesn't appear to have any kind of Spark database. So maybe we need to start using Hive and then we'll see it. Um, again, we'll see when it's managed to read this data, uh, data frame, we'll see what's actually happened. Uh, so what's that? So I've got add text, which is interesting. So let's just see. Um, okay, so it's just doing a markdown cell. So I guess in Databricks, if we're doing that, we'd have a separate cell and we do your kind of percentage MD, and then you start to do that. It doesn't look like we have, it's recognizing I'm trying to do a magic command, but it doesn't have markdown. So instead of using a magic command to do markdown, it looks like I need to do a different type of cell. So you've got either code cells or text cells. That's fine. You know, I'm not, not too bothered by that. Um, I did read that it's a little bit different in that. There we go. So if we're in Databricks, you kind of say, I want to go SQL and then PySpark and then back to SQL and then some Scala. You do percentage SQL, percentage Scala, percentage Python. Um, over in here, over in signups, we've got doubles. So I think we can do percentage SQL. Does that recognize it as a select step? There we go. Yeah, so that's good. So it's like these sort of allows us to do that mixing of languages. It's just we have a slightly different syntax, which is fine. We can learn different syntaxes. Still waiting for the Spark session to start. I'm assuming that is now provisioned in a cluster because I did, I gave it things like the auto turn off. I guess when I was doing it earlier, I don't know I could have designed that. I provisioned it, so I deployed the configuration uh, for that after Spark cluster. It didn't start it until I said, hey, go on some code. So I'm going to be a minute or two waiting for this to start up. I guess we can have a bit of a mooch around while that's working. So let's see, what else do we have? So Explore, I think, is going to be the main thing. Ingest is going to be interesting. So I want to try a lot of the ways we normally work with Data Factory is getting Data Factory to look at some metadata and then loop over the metadata and do a thing for each item in there. So if I'm trying to say load from this database and bring all my database into my leg, then I'd want Data Factory to say, list all my tables, for each table do a copy activity, put it in the right place in the leg. You know, so if you're using legs, each folder should be a separate entity. Um, a lot of documentation that we've seen around signups, you've got a folder and it's got loads of different tables worth of data just as files and that is Super bad practice in terms of building legs, but you know, still, I'll let them off. Um, so yeah, building out a nice metadata-driven pipeline is going to be interesting. So, okay, so this looks like straightforward data factory, except I've got some synapse things in there. So that's going to be interesting if we go back to normal data factory, whether or not we have uh, the synapse activities. And that looks very similar to the jobs that we have in Databricks, except we've got store procs. So it's interesting, so we've got a notebook that we can run, or we can run a store proc, I guess, depending on whether we're going on the Spark tools or the SQL tools. Kinda, kinda makes sense. Um, what have we got going on? Okay, so I'm not running pipelines, it's a Spark application, so it's in progress, so it knows that my Spark application is turning on. That's that's good. I'm not doing anything on the SQL side, so there's nothing on there. Okay, so I mean, that, that is nice that we've got the traditional data factory monitoring bits, and we've got some bits to look after our Spark cluster. So let's see, so it's turning things on. Oh, oh, that looks familiar. That is very much a uh, data lake analytics execution plan. 
So that's doing a few things. Actually, so that looks like that's the result of the job. So if we go back to, whoops, if we go back to our notebook, ooh, which is up here, I'm gonna take us so long to get used to having different tabs along the top. Okay, so we'll get rid of our pipeline. Okay, command executed. Uh, okay, that's slightly surprising. Okay, so we've got a data frame that was reading a delta table that already existed, and it's loading, so it found it on that linked data lake. So because I created the signups in a lake already, it was able to query the data that we've got. So let's just make sure it's not turning porkies. Can we actually just read that data frame, see what's in there? Okay, so I can watch the job happening now. Okay, so I can see it's actually doing some things. Doing three jobs? Okay, I mean, so normally uh, if you're reading a delta table, certainly there'll be one job to read the delta transaction log, a second one to actually go and read the data. Um, it's looking like it's doing a few different things. That'll be interesting to kind of figure out what it's actually doing. Cause that's definitely more jobs than you'd normally send when reading a table. Unless it's doing kind of some of the, the delta transaction log updates, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. But there we go. So we have just a straight table. We've got the charting stuff, normal Jupyter notebook kind of things. You can see a load of data in there. Okay, grand. So that is good. So it looks Delta compatible uh, out of the box, which is one of the worries. Uh, and yeah, that's that's not too shabby at all. Okay, so what else can we do? Let's try and do something a little bit fancier. Um, okay, so first let's try and do a bit of SQL on it. So we can do some SQL like that. No, we can't. So there's no, it's not currently in the SQL context. So normally we had create a replace temp view. Okay, that's traditional sparky stuff. And um, we call this, oh, what's my table, this address. Okay, so can I do that? Yeah, seem tacky. So that was good. So can I then go and query my table? So I select star from, okay, so it's not picked up uh, the IntelliSense for the temporary stuff, that makes sense, wouldn't expect it to. Um, so, bit, so that's doing the exact same thing I just did. So that display on that data frame to, to see it, and then select style from that uh, to review. They're doing the same thing, they're just saying, show me my data. Ooh, okay. So Java runtime there, no scratch directory, temp, hive, and HTML should be writable. Okay, so it's trying to write something. Um, I guess this is it trying to actually create the temp review for me in hive which I'm surprised it didn't do in the earlier step, but I guess, um, so that's my missions thing. So from what I've seen, signups seems to work on a managed identity. So it should have access to some parts of my leg. Um, let's, let's go and have a bit of a mooch. Okay, so we've got our beer here, I've got a friend. We've now got temp. And I think that's, it was saying it didn't have access to temp. Okay, so yeah, no, so there's no, no managed service in there. Let's see if we can fix that quickly. Always good, a bit of live debugging, <laughs> see if we can get this working. Uh, so that was my advancing leg. Uh, and so let's just see. One of the warnings it gave me when I was creating signups was that it was going to add some role assignments for me. Um, is that okay? Advancing signups, so it's going to create it in there. Oh, you can see that I spelled signups wrong. So you can see this is definitely me. Uh, so it's got that. So I have that as an actual entity that's been done. Okay, so it does exist within there. So let's just see what it's done over here. So I've got my root container. Uh, I can try to manage access to the base level. I don't have that, okay. Um, so can I, can't do that over here. So if I look at signups and see if that's done it, Okay, cool. So the signups one, the one that's created when I provisioned it has proper access. The one that was created here, this temp one, hasn't got access. So if I add him in and just say, sure, you've got access. Uh, let's give it everything it needs. Give it default. Uh, when you're dealing with um, hierarchical namespace, that's uh, AWS Gen 2 stuff. Uh, if you give it default, that means any new objects created underneath there are going to inherit that same access. Um, anything in there? Uh, yeah, so, oh, 
<laughs> I'm waiting for them to build the recursive stuff. Um, okay, it's going to put that in, you're going to hit add, and then give that the same stuff. And then hopefully there isn't a million files. If there's a million files in there, then we're not going to uh, be able to fix it, but let's see. Cool, nothing in there. Okay, cool. All right, well, so now it should have access to that temp area. Again, maybe it won't have this if I've set it up in a brand new lake and it had its entire own environment. Maybe it's the fact I'm reusing a lake. Um, who knows? <laughs> okay, so let's go back over here. Have a go. Okay, so it's nice to do that. Will you now actually create a template table for me? Or will you just tell me that something else is broken? It's doing a spark job. So I don't think it did a spark job earlier. So that's good news, running less stuff. Again, I don't like the fact that you can't see how many number of tasks there are. Because uh, normally if I'm doing some spark debugging, I'd have a look at the number of tasks and say, oh, that's partitioned badly. I need to run a repartition or a coalesce to change the number of uh, RDD blocks. Looks like I've kind of got just uh, got some stuff, but I do have data. Okay, so if you're using this and you want to set it up and you want to use Hive, it looks like you need to do a bit of permission wrangling when you first set it up and then it seems to work. Uh, okay, so we can use Hive, that's great. So let's try and do it another way. So do I have a database over here yet? Okay, I thought as much. So me doing that, just temp creating a temporary one in Hive, that has to have a Hive Metastore. I've said, please use Hive, and then it's actually worked. So that's now got this default spark. There's nothing actually in it. I've not saved any proper tables, but it needs that just basic database to be able to do anything. So that's good. Can we do it the other way? So let's um, try and do something. I'm not liking how deep to the bottom of this screen I'm getting here. It's a bit awkward. Okay, so let's, so still in SQL. Okay, do a create database. I just want to create my base layer. So I've actually all those things in that same zone of my lake and start registering them with Hive. And if that works, I should then be able to see that database as a separate one alongside that default. Certainly that's the way I'd normally work with Hive. Uh, no data, okay. I mean, that sounds like it successfully did it. Base, all right, nice, easy. Okay, so I've got a Spark table, that's good. So um, I can do some more SQL. Let's do it the other way around. Let's do, um, so I'm doing Spark Doc SQL. So I'm doing this, so I'm writing Python, but I'm using Python to execute some SQL because I can. Uh, so this is create, um, yeah, create table, if not exists, I'm gonna call it base.address. Um, oh, but we're gonna doing this from Delta, so I'm gonna have to look up the syntax because I never remember the syntax for that off the top of my head. I can go over there, let's see. Um, If we can get this working, those are definitely interesting because this is how I normally work uh, in terms of building out something frameworky, uh, in terms of actually getting something that can do a load of manipulation, get a load of data into the lake, do some automated cleansing or transformations or whatever it happens to be. And then when it's done, we can then say register that with Hive. Because we register it with Hive, it appears as a SQL table, and people don't need to know it's at this location in the lake. I need to use a Parquet reader, I need to use a Delta reader. Uh, they can just go, you know what, select star from my table, and it kind of gives that layer of abstraction away from all the other stuff that's going on in there. So I'm gonna grab this from so the function that I normally use just to kind of wrap all this stuff up. I'm gonna show you. There we go, so this is what I would normally do. Something like that. So I make a little Python function, pass it the name, pass it the zone of my lake, pass it the file path, and that'll do something really easy and register it. So we go, so I just need that using delta location and I can pop the path in. Okay, so let's try and see if that works. Grab my path from up here. All the way up. Okay, so this is the path I wanna try and use. So if I can do this, so this isn't gonna move any data. It's not gonna make a separate copy of my data in a certain place in the lake or any of that kind of stuff, which a lot of savers table stuff does. Uh, this is going to create just basically some metadata that points at my table. Uh, whoops, put it in the wrong place. We want it there. Okay, so if I get rid of properties, you should be able to see that a bit better. 
So create a replace. So create table does not exist. My database, the name of the thing using delta location, and then this nice little address, and we should close off that Spark SQL. Fingers crossed, see if that actually works. Okay, so that came back and said it's done something, so we should get rid of that. Uh, okay, so we now should be able to actually refresh. Oh, we've got address, nice. It has an array of columns, <laughs> that's good. Okay, but at least I have now a table registered with Hive that's now permanently registered. Uh, so again, in my little SQL land over here, I can go select star from base dot address. See if that's going to work. Well, that's kicking off spot job. Looks like it's doing something again. Doing probably doing some delta manipulation. Pull it out. Show me my data. And I've got a table of data. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually all right. So all the traditional stuff I would normally do of registering tables with Hive, pulling that into separate Hive databases, so I've got some kind of control over it. Allowing analysts who maybe aren't that Spark friendly to come and just write some SQL through it. Now, again, all of the SQL I'm doing here, I'm still doing through the Spark engine. I'm not using the SQL pools or the SQL on demand. So there's a load of other sides I've not even looked at yet. Um, but from an initial first principle, does Spark work? Spark works. So that's nice. Um, so just to kind of cap it off, the next kind of thing I would do, hopefully I've got a load of tables that I want to register. So I'll do something uh, along the lines of, let's see, um, sort of tables, uh, I can make that an array. So when I've got address, so I want product in there, I'll actually make it so it matches the thing. I've got product category. What else have I got in my little storage? And I like being able to refer back to the like, that is good. Okay, base, public, VeggieWorks, sales. Uh, it's a product, product category, and sales of detail. That's always the useful one. Okay, and let's get that in. Okay, so quick little function. Make me some tables. I want to be able to go through it. Again, right at the bottom of the screen here. It's quite annoying. Um, so I want to say uh, for table in tables. Normal for each loop, iterate through my list of stuff, do a thing for each. Well, let's just make sure that's working. So let's just print, doing an F string. So an F string is a fancy Python string. Uh, we can just insert something in the middle of it. So I'm going to take this. So we take this whole thing and we're going to parameterize it. So for each one of that, I want to generate the same SQL statement. Got a little curly bracket there, which is where I'm going to put my table name in. And then I've got a little bit there where I'm going to do the same. So we just delete that and put a bracket so I can put table in there as well. So it's going to make me a string. It's going to create a table that does not exist base and then the name of my thing at this location, blah, 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 blah. And then the name of my thing. So that should hopefully work. Let's just see. That should just give me a list of SQL. There we go, so I've generated a little, just a few Hive registrations. So actually I can switch that around. Use the same thing I used earlier. And just say, go register these things with Hive. Again, I quite like a right click register with Hive button. You know, that'd be nice. Um, but then everything else I have to run it this way. Okay, so something's exceeded, it's going through. Okay, so that looks happy. And there we go. So I'm starting to build up a Hive representation of my data lake. I can pull it in, I can write normal Hive stuff, I can write some Python functions and loop routes and things. Yeah, seems pretty good. I can work with this for now. So yeah, I'm gonna do some more digging in another session. I'm gonna go into some of the more Delta functions. Can we do time travel? Uh, can we do, we can't do optimize because that's a Databricks only thing. We're going to do things like vacuum and tidy up the transaction log. But yeah, so far, so good. That all seems quite nice. So thanks for joining me today. Uh, again, I hope that was useful. And I hope you're going to join me on my little journey into the depths of sign up, seeing can we actually use it in anger? Now, obviously, it's still in preview. 
There's going to be some bits that don't work, going to be some bits that change, going to be some bits that evolve as we go. But yeah, it's exciting stuff. Thanks for joining. We'll see you soon.